Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is NIDIG. NIDIG's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, NIDIG is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using NIDIG, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, NIDIG has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out NIDIG as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. I have a quote from Carl Friston. I don't know if you're familiar with this guy. Very familiar with Friston's work. Okay, so he says, quote, the anatomy of any system has to contain within it a model of the environment in which that system is immersed, unquote. Yes. And then the, the image that comes to mind on this is the microscopic image of a brain cell and then the macroscopic image of galactic superclusters. I don't know if you've ever seen these images side by yeah. side, yeah, but they're yeah. damn near identical. Um, is that perhaps some form of explanation for this we're plunging the depths of the psyche but we're finding the secrets of the universe that we have this map between our ears that's evolved to reflect the larger universe well i would say that and that map also evolved out of and was constrained by the fundamental structures of that universe um so it, it, it's sort of going both ways I mean, Friston says something really interesting. Uh, he also says, um, he says something to the effect, so I'm not quoting verbatim, but I'm getting the main idea, that the self is not a model, of, like the self doesn't have a model of the environment. It is the model, like of the mm. environment, right? Um, that it's, so if you, if, you, if, you, if you understand the model, not as something you have, but as something that you are, and participate in you're actually getting closer to friston's intent and uh, and in that sense very convergent with what i was previously saying that you know it's not so much that we have ideas of evolution but that cognition is actually implementing very similar design features of yes. introducing variation and putting selection of pressure on it and then introducing variation from that and in a, a self-organizing fashion. Wow, it's so, it seems like you get back to that line between like what evolution seems to be kind of aim, aimless or goalless in a way. It's just kind of increasing yeah. fitness versus conscious, conscious evolution, yeah. or you're actually so, directing your own evolution. Exactly. And I mean, so exactly. And it, it's just, so you get this thing that non teleological, non-intelligent processes evolution produce beings that act on purpose intelligently right and, but and, and so and of course some people will disagree with me who will say well ultimately those non-teleological non-intelligent processes can't explain intelligence and purpose so there has to be a grand intelligence acting on purpose to make us yeah um and 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 my response to that is well first of all uh, it, it, we've got a lot of evidence that it can produce life and variation in life yeah. um, and intelligence. And secondly, attributing it to a being that already possesses intelligence and purpose is not explaining anything. Uh, what I would now need is, is there any explanation of why that being is intelligent and acts on purpose? Or if not, all I've done is transferred the question. Yeah. And generally that's when people will start invoking, well, this, then they and then it comes sort of around at least when people mm -hmm. are open to open discussion they'll say 
well, because God, you know, is sort of ultimate reality and ultimately reality has this sort of structures in it. And then you go, but then, right, it seems like what you're doing is proposing sort of what I think we're proposing, which is a deep continuity idea. Mm. I'm not mm. saying, please, Robert, I'm not claiming everybody's going to instantly agree with that, <laughs> what I'm saying. Uh, but what I mean, there is. I think like there's design in nature. That's a book that was written about. There's increasing evidence that right, there seems to be these kinds of patterns that keep showing up because of intrinsic trade-off relationships. Ultimately, I would argue between invariance and variance within reality, and they keep expressing themselves at multiple layers, but the layers are not identical because although the, the principles are, the identical principles are expressed. Right. The way they're expressed is it has significant differences within it. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I like what you just said. I like the idea that a non-teleological, non-intelligent process sort of gets instantiated in the brain, but it gets instantiated in a living thing that's seeking, and therefore mm -hmm. it becomes ultimately intelligent and teleological. Right. So the 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 crux maybe of this debate between determinism and free will. Is it how do you get free will from a deterministic reality? And then it, it, roughly, yeah. and then Persig almost flips the whole thing and he says, no, there's no determinism. It's all free will all the way down that even these atoms have a seeking behavior. So it's, it's value and free will all the way down versus determinism all the way up. And so I know, I know very clearly, like Alex Duradovic is a clear example that it's, it's agency all the way down even mm -hmm. within microorganisms, right? It's yeah. agency. He likes to say it's agency all the way down. Um, and, and in a very intellectually responsible and respectable manner. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the issue I might have with Persig, and I'm not, a, I, I'm not uh, Sabella King, I'm not a, a, an expert on Persig the way she is, um, and the way she's built a community very admirably around it, um, is, I think uh, I think when we invoke free will, um, it's not clear what we're invoking. Mm -hmm. Like so, and and this is one of the things that frustrated Spinoza. He said, "If you mean agency, you mean self determination, and if you mean self determination, that's what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And that means no, no, nothing within the universe is com ever completely self determining, or it would be right. completely unresponsive, and therefore you have to modify what you mean." But when I've talked to people, they often mean something like that. They mean an a-causal principle mm -hmm. of choice within them, like an unmoved mover. Um, and I'm not clear that you could provide any evidence that that exists. And secondly, right. more importantly for me, since we're talking about choices, why you would want that? Like, uh, like th this, this clearly seems to be the case for me and many of the people I admire. I want my thinking to be as as completely determined by what's true as possible. Mm -hmm. I want my behavior to be as completely determined by what's good as possible. And I want my sensibility be, to be as completely determined by what's beautiful as possible. I like freedom. To, like, do I, I would love it if I, <laughs> if I could be completely determined that way. Isn't that, isn't that what we're seeking? Like, aren't we seeking to be determined? Like, and therefore we're sort of misunderstanding what we're asking for when we're asking for free will, I think what we mean is we want that the way we're determined to be like enmeshed with our processes of self-organization so yeah. that I am seeking the truth and the truth is determining my seeking. Yes. But well, do, do, you, do you understand the point I'm trying to make here? I do, I do, I do. But there, there's some maybe presuppositions here that I, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the assumption there is that there is one truth or one direction of goodness or one direction of beauty in a way where it's, I'm not sure that, especially with beauty, like that seems to be the one that's very, you know, uh, more subjective. Again, we're stuck in this language all the time. I don't even know that, you know, we're always saying subject, object, objective, subjective. We're really no, no, I think you're point. I think, yeah. we, we could, you're still making a good point. That doesn't mean I have to, I'm going to force you to try and defend the subject object, object economy. You're saying like, can't there be many different things that are beautiful? Um, 
And, and I take it that's the case, but I, I wasn't trying to convey that. I meant, but I want it that my actions are nevertheless determined by my, my, my sensibility is determined by something that's beautiful. And, and so we're saying, but you might be wrong. We're not, I'm not making an epistemological point. I'm making a causal point. Mm. Like I really want it that I could deeply, truly, honestly say, I want to look at that because it's beautiful, mm -hmm. or I want to do that because it's good, right. or I want to believe that because it's true. A and it's like, do I, like, do I want choice beyond that? Well, I want to be able to not believe it, even if it's true. I don't want that. Ah, okay, okay. So you're saying you want your value, your highest values to be what is true, good, and beautiful. Because what and if I you- I want that to be completely determinate of my behavior. Yes, that's interesting. That's what it is. That's what it is to be rational. Yeah. It's paradoxical in a way that, yeah, I don't, that's hard because, yeah, yeah. If, if there is this, uh, again, objective truth or whatever, objective direction of, of beauty or goodness, then you would want to be oriented towards that no matter what you might think you want, right? Like if you, you, you don't want self-deception to come between you and that ultimate aim which is yeah. part of what you're trying to eradicate with wisdom, right? Is, I mean, and Orwell made that point really, really deeply in 1984. Like, you know, Winston wants to be able to say that two plus two equals four. Yeah. That was the big thing, Yeah, right? Yeah. The party wanted to be able to say, no, we want to have the power to say that two plus two equals five. And that's, that, that's the tyranny. Yes. It's like, yeah. They want something other than the truth to be determinative of your belief. Yes. So they, they want to have the choice and the power. Well, yes. I, I, I think we should, I mean, I'm going to use, you know, a provocative language here. I think we should, we should be serving the truth, serving what's good and serving what's beautiful. That's yes. how we should understand our existence. Yes. Okay. I, that's very interesting to think about. I want to just, <laughs> We keep getting off on these <laughs> rabbit trails here, but I want to touch on one other thing you just said, which was the a causal principle, which I think Carl Jung described that as synchronicity. Synchronicity. Do you and see synchronicity as part of that pursuit of what's good, true, and beautiful? So synchronicity is very, very interesting. And, and, and like you can put two unions in a room about synchronicity and get four opinions about it mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> like there's a lot of variation on whether or not you get into really tricky spots because you end up saying things like synchronicity made something happen, but then you're making it a causal thing. Right. Um, mm. And then some people say, well, all young meant is it's a causal thing, but we don't know what the cause is right now. And it's right. Or mm. other people say, no, it's a genuinely a causal principle. I'm not mm -hmm. qualified to determine what Jung actually thought in yep. that dispute. Um, what I can tell you is this, and then maybe this will be a germ for us to talk a bit about. And, may, and I'd like to get back to ultimately to myth and how myth may be a way of picking up on these fractal patterns that we participate in as much as we reflectively construct ideas about. Yes. Uh, but when you're doing, when you're doing sort of inner work, psychodynamic work, um, you get, I mean, so Jung's, like more formal definition is meaningful coincidence. You get things in the external world and the internal world to they 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 seem to be relevant to each other, yeah. um, right. and that and that of course brings in all kinds of problems because we we tend to forget things. Like let, let me give you something that's easy to refute. People will say, you know, I was thinking of a Agnes. I hadn't thought of her in like months and months. I thought of her and she called. Yeah. Oh. And it's like, yeah, but you don't keep track of all the times you think of people and they don't call right. or all the times right. you think of people yeah. and they don't call. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, like, or don't think of people and they do call, but that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and yeah. then if you do, you realize, oh, this isn't anything miraculous. So you have to be really careful because when you're talking about things are relevant to each other, well, relevance is right. Right. Relevance yeah. is a, a thing that binds the inner and the outer world together. That's one of its defining features. Yeah. So you can find, relevance in a, in a lot of places. Now, on the other hand, right, what happens here, I'm trying to be really careful and really honest at the same time. I hope I succeed. 
you get to, you get more of these meaningful coincidences that become apparent to you that seem to afford your path of transformation that you're engaged in. Right. Yes. Meaning. Yes. Meaningful to your valued path through life. Yes, exactly. And meaningful in the sense, not just of, oh, isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Meaningful in the sense of actually affording you taking another step on the path. Yes. Uh, uh, now, that, that, <laughs> that is both important <laughs> and ambiguous. It's important and pretending it doesn't exist, I think, will make people unnecessarily truncate their own projects of transformation mm -hmm. but pretending that you've now discovered some psychic magical power or connection to reality i think is also a mistake mm. and so i try to treat it more like i was saying that uh, this is as I get more into the depths of the psyche, I'm more liable to pick up on more complex patterns in the environment. Um, and that is going to sort of intuitively allow me to become more in sync with the environment. And by the way, that, I mean, that some people might already say, oh, he's eating a lot of granola and that's getting hokey already. <laughs> but like, it's a very reasonable hypothesis, you know, and I've published on this with, with Leo and Arian, Leo Ferrara, Arian Hera Bennett, that one of the things that's going on in flow state is we're getting an optimization of our ability to, to pick up on complex patterns in the environment uh, and, and do that in a very adaptive manner. And that, so we're getting a lot of, and people report this in the flow state. Yeah. And, and it's, it's I, I'll report it too. When I'm in the flow state, I feel tremendously at one. It's like an mm -hmm. ongoing synchronicity. You're sparring and the, your hand just goes where the block is needed. Yes. And the punch yeah. just finds the space, right? And that really happens. Now, I think that there is a completely, and I've published on it, scientific explanation of that within the flow state. And what I'm suggesting is something analogous is happening to that when people are going through more longitudinal attunement to their environment, Mm -hmm. They're getting something like that in the synchronicities. That's what the proposal I would offer. Interesting. Very, yeah. Oh. oh, man, I'm really. OK, just a, a little bit more down this and then we'll go back to our original arc here. <laughs> uh, so I want to get into Carl Jung, I, which I haven't read much of. Most of it's secondhand through Jordan Peterson, um, my knowledge of him. But I think he's just a very fascinating guy. He also has mm. this concept of circumambulation. Yes, which he gets from Plato, by the way. Which he gets from Plato. I did not know that. Um, he gets the notion of archetypes from the Platonic tradition, too. Oh, uh, really? Interesting. Jung is, Jung, in many ways, and this is why he's also attracted to Gnosticism, mm -hmm. uh, because of the connections between Gnosticism and Platonism. I have two finger puppets on my fridge. One is Plato, one is Jung. They're holding hands. <laughs> uh, Jung, Jung, nice. For me, and I think you can make a very good case for this, Jung is very much like the Plato of the psyche. In a lot of ways. Oh, okay. Interesting. So what I, I and this is, and I'm clearly inspired a lot by Persick's book, Leela. I'm also doing a series on that once so I've been thinking, I've been reading through the book a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I looked up, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the woman's name, the YouTube channel. Stella King. Yeah. I looked up her YouTube channel. She has some very good point. Like yeah. her analysis is very interesting. Yeah. Um, she, she's seeing it in a way that my, my, the guy I'm recording the series with and I hadn't seen it. So it was very helpful. Um, and maybe I'll talk to her at some point too, because she, I recommend it. I yeah. think she, she's like, if you are deeply in a sense, like you, you are, if you're deeply interested in Persig and, and also, you know, about this corner of the internet, about meaning the meaning crisis, mm -hmm. the Bella King, I highly recommend you talk to her. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will take it, take you up on that recommendation. So just to speak to circumambulation a bit. And again, Persig's making this case that, okay, subject object metaphysics might just be one way of looking at the universe. There might be this other metaphysics of value. And this actually inverts causality. He yeah, makes the yeah, point yeah. that you could go through the entire scientific corpus and replace A causes B. You could strip that out and replace it with B values, precondition A. Yes, and you would, yes. you would change none of the data, but all of the interpretation. 
All right. Yes. So there, there's some relationship. And, and this gets back to uh, Jonathan Peugeot, actually. I read yeah, his yeah. brother's book, The Symbolic Language of Creation. Yeah. And they yeah. talk about the ancient conception of time being circular. Yes. Right. And before we got into this linear conception of time, which maybe yeah. maybe that was part of the axial revolution, actually. Yes, it was. It was. Um, yeah. That there's this, if you consider time as circular, then really what we call causality could also be, there could be a backwards flow to that or something opposite to that. Yeah. Yeah, because the past becomes your future. Um, yeah, you, so you, so the pa- the future is somehow in conversation with the the present to pull it into the future, and that's what getting back to Carl Jung's concept of circumambulation. The way I understand it is that you can set your moral aim very high, right, and you're you're basically visualizing your ideal future self, you know, based on based on values or whatever, and then that act trying to accord your trying to circumambulate yourself to that target is what calls your best qualities into existence in a way and actually allows you to bridge that gap. So there's this, and the way I think about this is I used to do Olympic style weightlifting and it was so important to do visualization in that sport. Like you had to visualize your future self executing the lift perfectly repeatedly thousands and thousands of times to go out and actually do it to embody the action. So yeah. I'm like, was that me in converse, my future self in conversation with my present so I could go out and make that happen? Um, and it just seems like so causality and value maybe are flowing forwards and backwards through time. Or maybe they're the same thing somehow. I don't know. I'm way out on a limb now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's interesting because you, you, you brought up an aspect of circumambulation that was never sort of sort of that central for me. Um, I mean, circumambulation means to walk around, to circle around, right? And, and in, the, in the Platonic idea, it's the idea that we need something like dialogue, dialogos, mm-hmm. because, right, none of us can get the complete perspective on truth. But if we circumambulate it, like if we go around it, we, we get a much better approximation to what it is yes. than any one viewpoint, uh, yes. that kind of idea. Higher resolution. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, right, and 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 I and I understood um, Jung's archetype, like that we circumambulate around them, right? Mm-hmm. So they're they're attractor states for many of our different processes. Yes, but you're right that the notion of an attractor state, and I'm building back to your point, is the idea of something drawing us in as opposed to um, us pushing it forward. Yes. Yeah. So the work of Dennis Walsh, who I mentioned earlier, who's, who has been trying to bring back a scientifically legitimate form of teleological explanation is the idea of conducing um, that. So, you know, that the, the, that the, the, the bird's wing is the way it is because it, it's conducive to flight, mm-hmm. right? And we make those kinds of explanations and we take those explanations to be legitimate, but they're not causal explanations, uh, but they are some kind of explanation. And and so wherever, the, I, I mean, this gets very complex and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. Wherever we're trying to talk about seeking again and function, um, it's hard to talk about it without invoking teleology, mm. but it's also equally dangerous to think that that's just like causation. Mm. Um, and and He's like he's trying to get the idea that what we're talking about is ways in which one thing makes a difference to another thing. Mm-hmm. And one way in which a thing A can make a difference to B is A can cause B. Mm-hmm. Uh, but B can make a difference for A if B is conducive to A. Mm. So we can talk about A making a difference by causing B. But B making a difference to A by being conducive to A, which doesn't mean that B is causing A. It means that it makes a difference to what kind of thing A is and how under how A can be understood. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's of any help, but no, no, it is. It is. And I'm I'm, one more thing, and I'm going to bring this back to what our original (laughs) art. Piaget's book again. Again, it's his brother. I think that wrote this, Matthew. Um, Matthew, Matthew, yeah. Matthew, yeah. Yeah. So they, they talk about this fractal layering of reality and that uh, what life 
is is essentially this intermediate force between what they call heaven and earth. And we could conceive these as like heaven being the principal space of principles and ideas and earth yes. being like material causality. And there's a, yep. a, con- a conformity, I guess, of the two yep. in life. Like we are earth animated by principle and information. And, and, jo- and Jonathan would be the first to admit, I mean, he has no problem with this because he's Eastern Orthodox, that this is straight out of Neoplatonism. Mm. And what Whitehead and other people are doing, and especially for me, the most important Neoplatonist for understanding this mm-hmm. is John Scottus Erigena, because Erigena, these the thing I'm going to talk about becomes very explicit and very clear. So you can talk about bottom-up emergence, how water emerges from hydrogen and oxygen, and how life emerges from water and other chemicals, right? And mm-hmm. so you can talk about bottom-up emergence. But then you want to say, but why do why do these similar patterns keep showing up all over the place? Well, there must be top-down constraints. And that's what, and that's the Neoplatonic idea of emanation. Mm. There must be things that structure the space of possibility in mm. right, so that the emergence keeps finding these patterns again mm. and again and again and again. So there's top, there's bottom up emergence and top down in, uh, emanation. But here's what you have to do: you have, to, and this is perhaps where Jonathan Klein might disagree. But this is what I see Erigena saying: is you shouldn't think of it as it's sort of emergence up to here and emanation right. down to here. It's actually all the way, emergence all the way up and emanation all the way down. Right, interesting. So then is it then the emergence is sort of coalescing to the invariants that are being emanated from above? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and notice you invoked very well the notion of a principle. A principle isn't yes. a thing, it's an event. Right. So right. one species of principle is something like a scientific law, mm-hmm. like E equals MC squared. Well, where is that? Like yes. It's not an event. It's right. Like it is, it's a constraint on how anything can happen in the universe. So things invariantly, like the speed of light, yes. have the shape that they do, yes. right? This is so interesting because I – Another definition of life that I've found is I've said it's a survival strategy propagating through flesh. You could also say it's a principle propagating through flesh or survival principle. And I'm sort of defining principle here uh, or strategy, I guess you want to use that term as kind of a liquid law. Like it has this coherence, this structure that propagates across time, but it's also maintains its ability to vary at the edges. So to adapt yes. to yes. kind of like DNA, yes. right? DNA has a very yes. rigid, yes. consistent structure, but it changes a little bit over time. Um, yeah. And that's, that's actually part of the very notion of information in yes. formation from Aristotle. The original idea of information was a particular structural functional organization yes. that made something be the kind of thing it was. And the of course, gestalt, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. The yeah. functional. Gestalt, yeah. And so, to read to which we invoke that when we're trying to explain behavior, we're saying that there are structures to possibility that are as real as the structures we find in actuality. And that reality is the complete interpenetration of structured actuality and structured possibility and, and Possibility and actuality are co-determining each other all the time. It's incredible. Yeah, so possibility and actuality. That sounds like cause and value again in a way, right? Possibility is kind of potentiality and you're it, selecting. It, well, that, yeah. Potentiality. Notice how much we depend on the notion that potentiality is a real thing, like potential mm-hmm. energy. Yeah. Potentiality is not an event. Potentiality is right. a structural possibility. What you're basically saying with potentiality is that this has become more probable. And yes. when we say more probable, what we're saying is pro- possibility has a definitive structure or shape. If yes. you can assign probability, you believe possibility has a structure or shape to it. Interesting. Okay. And then to reel this all the way back into our original point, yeah. homemaking versus housemaking, yep. I'm guessing 
I'm hypothesizing here with you, I guess that homemaking would be more of that principle, right? Someone that's structuring the relevance of yeah, the domain, yeah, 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 making it yeah. livable or, or uh, structuring the affordances in a way that's useful yeah, to yeah. the inhabitant versus the house making is more the material, the earthly side of it. We're actually constructing yeah. it. Um, yeah. So you can talk about a structural functional organization that's emerging when you build a house. The Aristotle will be happy saying that we've informed the wood mm -hmm. so that it now acts like a house. That's mm. what we're doing. We're actualizing the wood into a house. Mm. Uh, what Walsh would say is, yeah, but when we're making it a home, we're trying to get it to instantiate, embody, and represent important principles mm. that we think regulate all of the cosmos for us. Now, like engineering principles, there. even. So engineering the principles, that, yeah. but... But to, in a house, yes. Yeah. I think in a home, what we're talking about is we're talking about um, person-making principles. Mm. Interesting. So, and this is where the engineering starts, I would say, to shade into the architecture, mm -hmm. uh, which is what are you doing? So what is your model of what a person is as opposed to a physical object moving through space? is what you're considering when you're making a house. Yes. When you're making a home, it's like, but how can we shape the space? Again, we're not violating the physics, but how can we shape the physics so that it becomes better at making a person? How do we do that? Right. So right. notice some things. We, we assign rooms to particular people. We don't have to do that, but we do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's your bedroom, right? And that's her bedroom, and that's his bedroom. Uh, and then we and then we have common space where we put up representations that it's shared. Like here's the family portrait of yes. everybody in the living room, and we call it the living room because we're supposed to share. Like and so we're doing all this stuff to try and afford right two principles by which we make persons. Yes. Right. The principle of individuation and the principle of group participation. And so we're structuring individuation and participation to make better, to, to turn the house space into a home, into yes. a person making space. This is the, again, I'm going back to Piaget's book, the pulling down of meaning into matter and the pulling yes. up of matter towards meaning and yes. blending yes. them in between. Yeah, so what you're doing is you are, yeah, you you are you're doing bottom up construction of the space so it emerges as a place, mm -hmm. but right, uh, but then you are placing things within it in order to change the kind of place it is. Yes, in person making place. Yes, and so this um, then points to this reciprocal relationship in this case yes. we'll go keep going with this analogy of and this is getting back to churchill's quote we shape our buildings and our buildings shape us i think this Very equally much. as we said offline earlier it applies to tools more generally or just our creations we yeah, create is, these things and there's a reflexivity yeah. back into us and we're in relationship so, with them i think i might be misremembering his name malafoss this is his i uh, you know how things shape the mind that's the book and this is what's called material engagement theory. Oh, okay. And it's the idea that we are not just using these things. We, and this goes back to psychotechnologies and technologies, as we use these things, they shape us in ways that we do not intend. Mm -hmm. They may make us different. Now, they may shape us in ways we intend, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they, all, they always also shape us in ways uh, we do not intend. Right. And, and, and and then part of what uh, Churchill was talking about there, of course, is the the artistry of architecture is to try and use the fact that places shape us uh, in some sort of good fashion, right? yes. rather than letting that be uh, just bottom up emergent, also have it be top down um, justifiable or something like that. Right. It, it, w w is software versus hardware kind of an analogy here too where we've got the home builder doing the hardware and the homemaker kind of creating the software so the, um, the i think i would say the housemaker is making the hardware and the homemaker is making the software. sorry i may have said that backwards yeah yeah 
Uh, I may have heard you the wrong way too. Yeah. Uh, it's analogous to the software um, in that the software can inform many different instances of hardware. This is called multiple realizability. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that brought down the identity theory. The identity theory is that whenever I'm talking about a mental state, I'm talking about a brain state, that mm -hmm. they're identical. Mm -hmm. I can reduce mental states. I can reduce and replace mental states with brain states. Talk. Yeah. This is a That's materialist the, yeah. viewpoint, right? Yeah, a very yeah. strict uh, kind of material. So, you know, Putnam and Fodor and other people pointed out, but if artificial intelligence works, that can't be true because the intelligent behavior is not running on a brain state. It's running on silicon and electricity and copper, and none of those things are doing anything in my brain. Yeah. So the same intelligent state can be realized in very different media. Mm. So it's multiply realizable. So the same structural functional organization, the logical structure of the program. Yes. Somehow the logical structure of the pro not somehow there's way of it's what I'm just saying, mm. right? It can be real. But the point is, it, then the idea is, well, maybe there's, you know, maybe how pain is realized in an octopus brain is actually very different from how pain is realized in a human brain mm. or the way intelligence is realized in a crow brain is very different from, so you don't even have to go to different biologies. I'm like, mm -hmm. sorry, but, but sorry, you don't have to just go between biologies and non-biological thing. You can maybe even find multiple realizability uh, within different species. And then of course there might be alien species that have a completely different evolutionary history and they don't have anything like what we have, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the idea, of the distinction between software and hardware is based on the idea of multiple realizability. And this is very much, it's not identical to, sorry for that, but it's not identical to the Aristotelian idea, but it's similar to the Aristotelian idea of you have a certain logical structure that informs matter and actualizes it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So this material engagement theory then, it would, could we roughly say, so the creations are influencing the creator and vice versa iteratively, would then psychotechnologies would be more in that software domain than the hardware they're, they're, domain? Yeah. Are, they, the, are, they, are, they, are they then more or differently influential on our development uh, I was just, I, and this is a hypothesis again, that we have neuroplasticity. We know that yep, much, we're more yep. plastic neurologically than we are physiologically, right? At least over yep. shorter spans of time, you can learn something and train your mind to do something differently more so than you can train your body to, you know, be seven feet tall or whatever in one generation. So do psychotechnologies then disproportionately impact this is it a faster reciprocity between the agent and the psychotechnology than a standard technology? I think so. Uh, uh, and the reason I think so is the most studied effect in all of psychology. So <laughs> the, the, the thing that has the most published articles attached to it, which is called the Stroop effect. Okay. I've never heard of this. <laughs> so if you want to join, if you want to go to the psychology uh, party, Make sure you can invoke the Stroop effect. Uh, it's like also the cocktail party phenomena, co cocktail party effect. S T R double O P. Yes. Okay. So the Stroop effect is this. I'm going to show you. I'm not going to do it right here. I'll just describe it to you. I'll show you a bunch of words, and these are color words like the word red, blue, green, yellow. Mm. But the word red is in blue ink, mm. and I ask you to tell me the color of the ink. And what people will say is they'll start to say red and then go blue and there's a delay, <laughs> yeah, measurable yeah. delay, a reliable measurable de delay. And what's interesting is you can't placebo your way out of the Stroop effect. I can incentivize you to get it right and it doesn't matter. You'll still suffer the Stroop effect. Now, it's like, why? Because literacy has been so automatized, so internalized to your cognition that mm. you can't separate your cognition from it like easily or readily. You have to pull it apart with a lot of effort. Yeah. Now it's interesting just to make it more provocative. There are two things that you can do to actually reduce the Stroop effect. Even though I can't placebo you out of it, even though I can't incentivize you out of it, I can hypnotize you 
and reduce the Stroop effect. That's how Emir Raz was able to show that hypnotism is an objective event and not just people pretending because uh -huh. you can't pretend your way out of the Stroop effect. Uh -huh. He hypnotized people and they, they, he was able to reliably and significantly reduce the Stroop effect. What's the other thing? Malakowski and others. Um, Moore and Malakowski, 2009, and then later. People who have practiced mindfulness extensively can also reduce the Stroop effect reliably. Huh, interesting. So, and those are both psychotechnological well, those are both, effects. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. So, so okay. Hypnotism isn't, isn't your particular skill. It's a way of standardizing the information so that your brain and my brain link up in some way so that your capacity, your self-organizing capacity gets linked to right the discussion. All hypnotism is ultimately self-hypnotism that is using another person, right? Right, 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 right. You're kind of mindfulness oh, psychotechnology too. It's kind of like opening the command line on your mind or something and then letting someone else well it's it's around the it, it, it relies on the deep fact that you well it's what we're talking about you internalize other people's perspectives into your own mm. radically deeply if you didn't do that you couldn't your ability to step back in mindfulness and look at your own perspective has come that gotsky would argue this the guy who came up with cultural tools right, would argue that the way, and I think he's right, the evidence I think supports this, the way I get the ability to step back and look at my own perspective is by imitating your perspective on my perspective. I imitate, you see children doing this, they imitate the parent's perspective on them, and they imitate it more and more and more until they can do it without the parent, and then it just becomes a way in which they can stand back and look at their own mind. We literally transcend through other, by internalizing other people. That's and hypnotism, I would argue, taps into that ability. Wow. So it's this. I, I'm reminded of this quote actually that the I'll paraphrase. This is a famous, I think a US Navy captain. He said, uh, the goal of the leader, the goal of the captain is to see the ship through the eyes of others. Like to to be able to actually transcend to the you know, yes. into the role of captain, if you will, and do it effectively, he has yeah. to look through the eyes of everyone else, which, which to get back to economics, like this is what a market is doing effectively is like you're plugging into distributed cognition. Yes. Yes. Um, and yes. seeing the world through the eyes of everyone else. So you can focus on what you're good at and depend on everyone else to figure out the rest. So that is exactly the right metaphor to use or the quote, because uh, Hutchins, who wrote one of the, the original books on distributed cognition, Cognition in the Wild, mm -hmm. did it by doing an, eth 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 an ethnography of how a crew navigates a ship. Hmm. There's no one person navigates a ship. Right. It, a it's a distributed cognitive system and a bunch of tools and a bunch of psychotechnology, uh, networking brains and machinery together that steers the ship. Interesting. Okay. So, psychotechnologies, they change us more rapidly than normal technologies, I guess. I think so. I think um, so. They at are... Least, I'm, not, I'm not sure about more rapidly, but perhaps more deeply, at least. More deeply, okay. Because, and I think that one seems, I don't want to say seems obvious, but it seems obvious to me. Like, if you just think about literacy... It's like yes. you pull out literacy, how impacted would you be? I think you made this point in yeah. one of your lectures. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's like, it's hard to even imagine how deeply that would impact you. It's so deep that yeah. it's hard to yeah. even actually generate the thought because how would yeah. you think without literacy? You'd think yes. imagistically, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, and then the externalization of psychotechnologies mm -hmm. are social institutions. I think so. I mean, part of what we do is we, I mean, the, the original computers were human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the original entities called computers were human beings. You had a floor in a business yes. where if you needed computation, you sent it down there and they did it. Yes. And those, right. Um, 
Um, and so I'm using that as like as a metonym for the idea that we're always doing that. We're, we're always tapping into the power of distributed computation, yes. distributed yes. cognition uh, when we're creating social institutions. And then what we're doing is we're standardizing the information flow, the information formatting, because we want, we're, we're trying to psychotech, psychoengineer, yes. right? Effective distributed cognition. And we, and we use language about, you know, we want everybody to be on the same team. And what we're basically saying is we want to, we want to make sure that, right, that people can plug into the distributed cognition very effectively and the reverse, mm -hmm. that the distributed cognition can plug very effectively into them. Right. Now that's a power and it can be used for good and for ill, as you can well imagine. Yes. Right. Uh, but it is a tremendous power. And, and so institutions are ways in which we, I would argue, where we create systems of psychotechnologies so that we create reliable configurations of distributed cognition. Yes. Okay. Agreed. And then the, in the economic lens, the totality of global distributed cognition, we would just say is the market. So the global market, if you will, sure. and pick, you know, pick a commodity, doesn't matter, copper, titanium, whatever. There's a price associated with copper or titanium. Yeah. This is the indicator of relevant. This is the intersection of supply and demand. So we have yep. uh, potentially unlimited demand, right? There's humans are never satisfied, frankly, but there's a strictly limited quantity of capital. Wherever those two curves cross is the price. So it's kind of like the indicator for relevance in the distributed salience landscape of market actors something like it, 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 everyone's voting on how much titanium or copper we need is demanded in the moment versus how much there is there's the price so that price metric or price signal becomes the nerve signal that coordinates yes the total distributed cognition of the marketplace yeah it, it makes use of i would say it makes use to some degree of mead's notion uh george herbert mead's notion of the generalized other Mm. Um, so me says, you know, I'm playing baseball and he's American, right? Of course, <laughs> right? Um, I'm playing baseball and, um, I have to do two things. I, I, I mean, I have to have a model of how other people are going to play and I have to, I have to have a little bit of specificity here. I have to know that Jones is on second base, but I can't track everybody all the time specifically it's it will overwhelm working memory mm -hmm. so what do i do i form a generalized other i form a generalized model of what, what any one of my teammates is likely to be like and therefore i can interact with that and that way uh, interacting at that one point i get a representation that allows me to interact with any potential part or or also or or thereby interact mm -hmm. with the whole team so the whole team comes into the representation of the generalized other I interact with that, right? And, and and then I right that facility. So everybody interacts with everybody rather than everybody. So rather than everybody carrying around nine models of everybody else, and those mm -hmm. all always what you have is the generalized other. And and then and then what Mead argues, of course, what he says is, of course, this is not just happening when we're playing baseball. This mm -hmm. is happening when we're doing any distributed cognition. And so we 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 gravitate towards things that allow us to get a generalized other me measure or metric. Mm. So, 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 go ahead. Uh, I was, we were trying to simplify the world, to decomplexify the world, right? By kind of putting uh, people in an, a bucket of expectations, something like that. Yeah, you're doing a kind, you're doing very much. So Mead wouldn't say this because I don't think he had the language available to him, but we're doing, we're doing a kind of data compression. Mm -hmm. We're doing like taking all this plot on a scatter plot, all the points, and drawing the line of best fit. Yeah. And that line of best fit is the best way of predicting on average how anybody's going to play. And it allows me to generalize to new players that I haven't met before. Yes. Data compression. What I've argued with other people, like as collaborators, is again, you see the brain doing lots of data compression whenever you're getting, you know, synchronized firing. But, but the thing is, you see the brain doing the opposite. You have self-organizing right. criticality. 
the brain synchronizes to do data compression and then it avalanches right to open up new like it's like evolution to open up new possibilities for new synchronizations and then it out right and so it's constantly oscillating back and forth between them uh, and there uh, uh you know there are there are our labs again this is controversial because whenever you're doing anything with the brain it's controversial but where that that the flexibility of that oscillation correlates with measures of general intelligence interesting okay so then all right so so th this brings up the thing about the generalized other the price you pay so you get this tremendous ability to deal in general yeah but you may have forgotten that jones is the guy on second base and jones always screws up if a southpaw hits to the shortstop mm, right so so this generalizability or generalization is giving you it's data compression so you're getting greater quantity of generalized data yeah. in your working yeah. memory but yeah. you're giving up yeah. quality potentially these these specifics yes. about jones and and this is again one of these universal scale invariant trade-offs yes it's called the generalizability discrimination trade-off yes as you gain in generalizability you lose in discrimination as you lose in discrimination you gain in generalizability and this is one of the philosophical arguments about money actually is how how it influenced our thinking to be more i guess this is the discriminatory because it's it, you put a quantifiable value on everything including labor and you know human hours and services so it makes us less um you know, you'll look at the cost of a massage is basically just the cost per hour versus the, it kind of obfuscates the quality, you know? Yeah, you start so I think it generalizes. On the price. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it it generalizes. So it's like uh, you lose, you lose what, so it's lossy, that, that's the term, it's lossy. Most generalized, most data compression is lossy, right? Um, and and that I think is a clear example of it. Mm -hmm. So you're you're losing what is idiosyncratically specific about that that yes. can't be captured by the money. Yes. Um, and this is like we were talking this before we started the recording. This is how all the the way literacy allows you this capacity to get access to other people's minds. Mm -hmm. It comes at a cost, which is it tends to overprivilege over and overprioritize mm. the, pro the propositional level. And we right. lose the procedural and the perspectival and the participatory. Right. And this is contributing to the meaning crisis to some extent. Very right? much so. Yes. Very much so. Okay. Yeah. So there are ways, I'm not saying this is always happening, but there are ways in which the lossy data compression in money and propositional tyranny can noxiously interact with each other and reinforce mm. each other. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So I want to add a wrinkle to this. And I guess first, if we zero in on money and uh, clarify my thinking here, I've been thinking about it. Like, is it, a, I've called it a technology in most of my writing historically, which it is, yeah. it is a technology. Yeah. It has yeah. uh, specific properties or affordances, if you will, that people, yeah. market actors seek. We seek yeah. these particular properties of the technology to make something that's tradable and scarce and all these other things. But it also has this psychotechnological Very component much. because it embeds itself in our mental machinery. We think in terms of money. It lets us plan, negotiate. Yes. Um, it, it's an it's a, it's a yeah. incredible form of data compression, right? Yes. If you can just translate things to dollars, you can process way more decisions than you could thinking about the individual qualities yes. of everything that you ever do. Very, very much. So, so it's just, and it's coordinating distributed cognition. Uh, it is a hundred percent. Yes. Yes. It is. Prices are expressed in money. Price is the nerve signal coordinating yes. distributed cognition. Here's where it gets interesting. I think so. If money is at least part psychotechnology, I guess it's kind of a hybrid in a way, yeah. hybrid technology, yeah. psychotechnology, somewhere in this blurred line. Uh, we know that changing psychotechnologies has this influence on us, you know, yes, this yep. profound. We have an institution today that's called the central bank. Yes. And if you would imagine that, um, this nerve signal that's meant to coordinate all this market action. Now, if there was 
noise introduced to that yes. signal channel. Yes. That's what's happening when we print money effectively. It's it's you know something's gone wrong in the marketplace. These businesses are failing, right? Which means they're they're not satisfying wants or they're not doing it profitably. So in normal capitalism, these like Darwinism, they would fail. Yeah. They would die. Yeah. Their component, the the capital that componentizes them would then get reassimilated into the market to a higher and better use. But when right. a, the central bank prints money and they buy these companies or they keep them on life support, and by the way, this is funny, they actually call them zombie companies. Right. By the way, this, this is the term that people use, which yeah. gets into yeah. your, we'll talk more yeah. about zombies later, but it it interrupts the signaling process and it 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 pathologizes distributed cognition. And then we end up with these entities living that aren't satisfying anyone's wants. They're just, they're parasites effectively. You know, the central bank is a parasite. They're, they're capitalizing these other parasitic organizations. And so I wonder what corruptive effect this has on us. It's like we've corrupted right. the psychotechnology that's so essential to us. We then see all these downstream effects in the culture. Um, it's got, it's, I mean, it's got to have a huge impact. Um, I, I like I, I so given the argument we've made, it has to have a significant impact. It's not something that I put thought or study into. Why it's which makes it a really good question. Mm -hmm. Um so uh the degree into which that's messing up I I, I guess it has to be there has to I'm worried that there's con that there, I guess I'm like it's, uh, causation's all almost always multivariate, not yeah. univariate. Yeah. And so I, I'm so I'm worried I'm, I'm worrying about offering any particular speculation because I'm worrying about confounds. But it, it, so it, it's reasonable that there should be some corrupting effect if money is servicing as a um, as a psychotechnology, then corrupting it will have huge impacts on cultural cognitive structures in a yes. profound way. But on the other hand, given what we said earlier, money per se as a compressive entity also will in and of itself yes. have potentially deleterious effects yes. on culture yes. and cognition. And so maybe, maybe one way of understanding, I'm not saying governments do this by any means, but one way of trying to specify the normativity of government intervention is to say, well, governments are supposed to try and ameliorate the side effects of having to use money that, that are the inevitable trade-off, but they shouldn't be doing this other, other corrupting thing over here. Mm. And, and that goes towards Plato's idea that, right, we should be selecting people to govern who are the most knowledgeable about how the society is actually running. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't feel confident to be in this position. Um, and, and I'm just, <coughs> you can hear the hesitation in my voice. I'm very hesitant about any of this. You know more about a lot of this than I do. But I was I was trying to say, there might be a way of re understand because I'm very interested in this proposal, mm -hmm. of re-understanding the role of government as, let's get very clear about how it, like, they can be corrupting the psychotechnology in a deleterious fashion. Mm -hmm. And let's distinguish them that from how they are needed to compensate from the fact that money per se is going to have deleterious side effects because it's a compressive function. Yeah, I wonder- That's a proposal. Yes, I think that about the second piece um, to compensate for money pushing us towards the more quantitative perception yeah. of reality, I think that's where language really comes into play, right? It's like to describe well, qualities of something, you need really good clear I was language. Of, I was thinking of, but again, I'm thinking of language. I'm not, I'm not thinking of just language. I'm thinking the thing that was in my mind was religion, was right? because mm. religion gets us out of the propositional, into the procedural, the perspectival, the participatory. It gets mm. us to engage in transformation. It uses myth to push our awareness into these fractal things. It's doing all of that, mm -hmm. right? And and, and the, the, the and so religion and the market used to have this sort of co-moderating 
relationship to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something Thomas Bjorkman talks about um, in the world that we want. Um, he actually talks about how we had three things. Uh, we had the state for we need coordinated labor, irrigation. We, we have to coordinate labor. Yeah. Like we have to get people to cooperate and, and a lot of stuff. Like yeah. Try defending your country on your own. You can't, right? You need to go get people together just to yeah. use a, a non-controversial example. Yes. Yes. The state, and then you have culture that's supposed to be compensating, right? Uh, they're all supposed to be compensating for each other in this right. sort of mutually constraining triad. And, and then he argued, like, we, 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 we've lost all the distinctions um, and everything is, is, is sort of merging into a homogenous thing. Um, so maybe the proposal is better that we need, because I, I don't like the idea of a government religion. That's a really bad idea. Yeah. But we need, yeah. but we need, we need, we need social institutions in which people are engaging in religious, spiritual, cultural transformation in ways that give them an arena other than the money market system. Yes, I guess. yes, yes, yes. And then we would need something like the state to properly adjudicate in the gray zone between these two. And that's what yes. it used to be. Right. That's what it used to be. I don't know. I, maybe yes. that's an act and medieval and i should just not no. i mean i am persuaded by thomas's argument that we're in trouble because we don't have we we don't have counter we don't have counterbalances we, we used to have a counterbalancing system between three spheres right. we've lost that and so the system is is spinning out of control in in, in certain ways yes yeah i think um they, they, there's a term for this in complex adaptive systems they're they're like buffers or shock absorbers right or yeah yeah. Um, in a, in a, dissipators. yeah, dissipators in a, maybe in a political institution sense, this is like the segregation of powers or duties, you know, the, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a checks and balance model. It's, yeah. it's, it's about, you know, selective and enabling constraints. Any self-organizing system needs, right. That those counterbalancing mm-hmm. constraints, or it, it'll start to go into vicious cycles yes. uh, one way or the other. So the, so, but, 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 but I, but, but I didn't want to, I'm, I'm not trying to paper over. Oh, sorry. That was a bad, that was a bad pun. I'm not trying to paper over your, your point. There's a point that you're making that I still want to, I, I still want to, it's a gem point, right? That if we remember that money is an, inf, a, a, an information, a, an information flow and management system for distributed yeah. cognition, yeah. then messing around with money could have very deleterious effects on a deep level on people's cognition. Yes. Yes. That I think is an important point. Yes. So I'd like to, and this is all, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. I'm not, I'm not proclaiming any of this as a, some kind of fact, but I would like to propose that money so again, I'll use the term protocol. Protocol is this this norm yeah. for interaction, right? We yes. have yeah. we have language yeah. protocols, That's we true. have nonverbal, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And they, and protocols again, back to Whitehead, they tend to be the thing that we put beneath our conscious awareness, right? They just become implicit in our behavior or embedded in our behavior, I guess, where you yeah. don't even think yes. about yes. it, but it's yeah. performing a very important function, allowing very us to to connect, you know, mind or action properly. So I think money, proposing money as the base layer protocol for human interaction. This is something that works cross-culturally in theory. Like if we just look, use gold, for instance, you know, you don't need, gold is sort of culture agnostic. Like so long as a, a group was ever plugged into distributed cognition in a way that they understood trade, you understand that gold is valuable. I don't need to understand your cultural norms or um, whatever surrounding it. So there's this, uh, it's a psycho technology that we're, so I guess maybe say, put it this way. There's a, if it's a protocol, then we're building applications, if you will, on top of the protocol. And these applications can really be businesses, could be social institutions, yeah. Could even be religious institutions. I think you could say, like a lot of the thing that led to the downfall of the medieval church was their economic corruption. Right? They were taking yes, in indulgences yes. and you know yeah, all, all of yeah. that. So, 
I do agree that there's a trade-off when we start to look at things through money. Like it's just, we're quantifying things. So we're giving up a qualitative yep, resolution yep. on reality, if you will. But to the, to the degree that we can keep that base layer protocol incorruptible, we can then make better, we can build better applications on top of it, like yeah. better businesses, better social institutions, whatever. And that is, that. and, yeah, okay. and yeah. it's, I'm, I'm, I'm blurred here because, okay, money's a base layer protocol, but it's also a psychotechnology. If we can make that incorruptible, which is essentially what Bitcoin is, it's an incorruptible yeah. protocol, something that no one can change. Yeah. Then all of a sudden we're, 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 cleansing the protocol layer so we can build better institutions and businesses on top of it. But we're also cleansing the influence the psychotechnology has on us, right? We're the That's central bad. bank today. So just for an instance, the central bank today can just print money. They could go buy any business in the world. So that say they just decided that uh, zombie tissue production was a good business to be in. They could go and just bid the shares of that stock. So kingdom come essentially. No market actor wants to buy any zombie tissue, but the central bank has just effectively twisted the valuation or twisted distributed cognition towards an aim that they arbitrarily determined. You know, and when I say this, the, the shareholders of central banks are like 0.000001% of the population. Yes. Like Yet they control the yeah, salient, yeah, yeah. the market based salience landscape, if you will, of, of all market actors, you know, 8 billion people. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> it's like, holy shit, we're in quite the pickle here. Um, we, we, it's, a kind I, I, of, it's a kind of tyranny is what I hear you saying. Yes. It's an economic tyranny, but it twists our perceptions on the world. Right. Where people and I think you see this people idolizing the dollar, people idolizing wealth, people, yes. Yes. fiat culture, fiat mentality. You made an argument last time that would strengthen the argument you're making now, if I understand you correctly, which is they not only idealize it, there's a craving because there's a sense in which, like you were saying, like you, you have to consume. You were yes. you made the argument you, you it forces you into a consumerist mentality. Isn't this a clear example of what you're talking about? Yes. Yes. Because, right. The, because the, the, the currency is corruptible, right. You, you are always incentivized to, cons to translate it into other things as fast as you possibly can. So you called this, I believe, temporal discounting. Yes. Hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic yes. discounting. So this. Co yeah. You're, you're co-opting. So hyperbolic discounting is across species, but yeah. you're, you're hijacking that function. When you were like part of what's powering consumerism is you already have an inbred, you have an inbuilt, not inbred, that was exactly the wrong word. You have an inbuilt, you have an inbuilt, right? Uh, uh you, machine or hyperbolic discounting. I'm sorry, I'm talking about salience discounting. Is that a different same thing? Same, same thing. thing. Okay. So this in Austrian economic speak is they call time preference. So the lower yes. your time preference, the more long-term oriented you are. And the yep. higher your time preference, the more short term you are. One right. major component of this is money or the interest rate. Yeah. And it's if your yeah. money is losing value over time, you have a direct financial incentive to spend it before it loses value. So this yeah. has the effect of making you of raising your time preference, which is a bit counterintuitive because that means making you more short term. Yes, yes, um, yes. And it that's and, and a lot of Austrians argue this too that civilization is quantified by how collectively long-term thinking we are. Yeah. We can't do intergenerational projects like we used to be able to, we used to be able to build cathedrals. Exactly. Um, Zach Science talks about how education has gone from being an intergenerational relationship to being a much more highly localized uh, relationship. Um, yeah. So it sounds like you're happy with my proposal that a specific instance of your argument is a consumerist uh, mentality that is plugging into and exacerbating a biological predisposition towards hyperbolic discounting, sales yes, discount. Absolutely. I think I think I think that's a that's a bona fide good argument. I think that's a good argument. And I would add to it, so it's that is 
inducing us into capital consumption more than it is capital accumulation, which unwinds civilization. Well, again, another metric for how civilized we are is how much capital have we accumulated. You could think of capital as like a buffer against risk or uncertainty. You know, things go wrong, we have resources to draw upon and survive. Um, So it's drawing down this stock of civilization, if you will. And then it's also because of the price distortion I mentioned earlier, it's causing a misallocation of capital. So the capital we do put to work, it's not going to work consistent with market actor uh, wishes, right? People voting with buying and selling. It's increasingly uh, directed by the policy of central banks, effectively. It goes from being a supply and demand, this emergent, spontaneous dynamic, to something that's centrally planned and determined arbitrarily. And that's really bad, too. Is it not the case also that one of the things people are going to convert their money into in a consumptive manner is they're going to try and convert their money into status and power? Yes. Uh, and so you're going is it's going to be a corrupting influence on politics as well. Then is that is is, is that reasonable to surmise from what you've been saying? I am about to publish this piece. Actually, it's funny you bring that up. That the very notion of politics, the reason it is such a major component of our individual and group identity is because property rights can be violated. So there's an incentive to try and get as close to the seat of power as possible, which in this Mm. case, it's the government, the monopolists on violence. They are the enforcer of property rights. So they determine whose property is what. And if they don't, they, again, when they print money, they're violating people's property rights. They're stealing from anyone that's using the dollar as a store value, for instance. Uh, when they give you a mandatory lockdown or a mandatory vaccine or uh, imminent domain, which is where they directly confiscate your property. all The entire purpose of government is to preserve property rights, but it's nested because property rights can be violated. The enforcer of the property rights can violate them to their own interests. And this is another lens on Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin's the first property right that's independent of the monopoly on violence. So it only depends on computer code and it's just information. So you don't need um, a local monopolist on violence, you know, saying enforcing the rights via via the law or whatever. So sorry, long, long answer to your question. I think the very emphasis of politics in the modern age is premised on the viability of property. So I think as a result of Bitcoin succeeding, we'll actually care. You won't we will have much less of a reason to care about one another's political leanings if property can't be violated. It's like, if I don't like what you think, we have a disagreement, well, great, we just go our separate ways. But in the current model, it's like trying to force this whole, um, these uh, heterogeneous viewpoints under one umbrella, if you will, in the nation, and it's creating this political strife and discord that's not necessary. We would We just have smaller more fragmented government that was more specific to the wishes of, of its population. I see. I see. Are you like, and I'm going to send you that piece actually, if you'll, it's not very long, but you influence a lot of it. Cause I talk about psychotechnologies a lot at the end. Cause I, I appreciate it. I think that what this is and back to the institutional overthrow, the inventing of the printing press led to the acceleration of, literacy and numeracy, but also the printing of money. Well, yeah, later the printing of money, which is kind of, (laughs) kind of ironic in a way, but at the time people woke up to the church, right? They're like, what the, what is this dominant institution? I'm giving this money to all of a sudden they had a direct relationship with God. They could open the book and read the word for themselves because they had the psychotechnology installed. Yeah. Uh, that led so this this psychotechnological upgrade led to this institutional overthrow. But then to your point, the printing press now, even though it's not even a printing press anymore, it's just entry yeah, on a like database. That. It originally was. Yeah. It was a printing press um, yeah. that's led to the corruption of money time and time again. Uh, it, it seems like Bitcoin could be another one of those upgrades, you know, to the extent that money is a psychotechnology. We could now have this protocol that's not corruptible that would lead to the overthrow of the dominant institution today, which is you know, this complex of the nation state and the central bank, the monopoly on violence and the monopoly on money. You break the monopoly on money, 
it at least mitigates the power of the monopoly on violence to the point that it's held in check by the wishes of market actors. Whereas today they do what literally whatever they want. They'll just print currency to do whatever they want until the currency hyperinflates, which is what we've seen time and time again. Well, I mean, um, two, two overall comments. I, I like the, the, the line of argument that you've made specifically about this, I think is very good. And I, I, I complimented you a couple Thank times you. along the way. Um, and I'd like to read the piece. Um, I, 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 maybe it's also a difference of what we mean by politics. I mean, I have an Aristotelian notion, which is a very different notion, mm. which is politics is the ethics of distributed cognition. Right. Mm. What we're trying to do is figure out we, we Aristotle, man is inherently a social animal. And he, what he means by that is most of what we do is in distributed cognition and that that distributed cognition has ethical requirements on us that are not the same as our own self-interest. Um, and so how and politics is about how do we balance those off against each other? And that one of the functions of government is to try and say, uh, like, how are we going to balance off where we need to work together um, and, and how we're dependent on distributed cognition? You didn't invent English, neither did I. Right. Right. Yes. Right. And collectively in distributed cognition, but the language has changed from 300 years ago. Who yes. changed it? Right. No right. one right. person changed yeah. it. Everybody changes it. Right. Yeah. And so and I'm not saying we should. I'm not I'm only using that as an example of distributed cognition. I'm not saying governments should come in and legislate language. Definitely but, not. <laughs> hey, right. Right. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is that you have to, right, and uh, you have to, you have to have something that manages the relationship between, right, our individual projects yes. and our collective projects. Yes. Right? And I, and so for me, there's also an ethical domain uh, for, because I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not. Like I, I hope it's clear. I'm not like like exhaustively disagreeing with you, but I think there are cultural protocols. I'll use your word. Mm -hmm. I think there are cultural protocols that have to do with distributed cognition that are not the same as the protocols that have to do with the management of property. The reason I say that is because how how property is understood and how much property you can have varies widely across cultures, and that nevertheless you see cultures having these these protocols in place um so you know and that was one of the issues you know with the grassy narrows community that we talked about in the book right there's yeah. a difference again back to homing and housing there's a difference between the western concept of property and the indigenous concept yes. and right and uh, between what's communal property and what's individual property and part not not all but part of the disaster there was a, a disjunct in those notions and so yes. I would want, I would, I, I'm not trying to undermine your argument. I think it's a good argument. I'm trying to amend it by saying, I think there's other things that are in the political sphere. Uh, agreed. And I'll, I'll clarify the definition of politics I was working from, which I had never heard Aristotle's, uh, yeah. the ethics of distributed cognition, as you define well, it. That's my, that's my gloss on oh, it. Yeah. He okay. Yeah. Stuff. That's, yeah. um, that's an excellent definition. It's not the one I was working from was uh, Clausewitz. Have you heard of him? Yes. He wrote on yes. war. Yeah. And yeah. he just says, you know, I think his quote is war is the continuation of politics by other means. By other means. Yes. Yeah. So yes. we're effectively and cl clearly politics exists at a micro level in human affairs all the time. You know, we're all, we all have our own little agenda and our aims are colliding yeah. and we're trying to sort it out. But to the point where that, those that microcosm of political decisions is then imposable on a broader population. Yes. Depends on the confiscatability or viability of property. It's like, here's the threat of force. You listen to my opinion or decision or else, and the or else is a violation of property. And here's where pro this is where the line gets blurry again. Okay. Because you mean something broader by property. Well, property as actually defined uh, in its deepest sense, like in the libertarian tradition, it really is about, first of all, it's a relationship. We always think property is a thing, like it's land or a house or a business. Property is a, an exclusively acknowledged relationship between the owner of the asset and the thing in question. So the property is the relationship, not the thing. And the ultimate, the closest, most form of 
the most personal form of property is your own time, right? You own yourself, you own your own time. No one can tell you how to move your left arm or what to think or what to do. And you forge other property relationships by combining that time that you own of yourself with nature in some useful way. You go out and plant a garden or you build a business or whatever it may be. So um, to the extent the state violates your time, even, it's not just your possessions is the point, right? Um, Violation of your time and how you spend your time. That's what you mean by it. Yes. So if they're violating your relationship with your time, which they are through taxation and inflation, they're effectively stealing your time um, or they're outright confiscating your property. All of these things are a political imposition, right? It's someone's opinion. It's like, this is the way things should be. Great. I'm not saying it's just purely one guy's opinion, which would be an authoritarian dictatorship. Maybe there's a more distributed version of it like we have in representative democracy or whatever, pick your form of governance. But the point is that once that consensus is reached, a limited consensus, it's imposable through the confiscation of property. Whereas if you have something like Bitcoin, it's money that no one can do anything about. So if if you just assume the whole world's on a Bitcoin standard, you could reach these political decisions in Washington and then they'd be like, all right, go out and impose them. And people will just be like, "What? you can't tax me, you can't inflate me. How can you tell me what to do? You know, there's, right. it doesn't eradicate violence. You can still point a gun at someone and tell them what to do. But this way of. But, but, but how does it encourage cooperation? Uh, I would argue what, that money is what encourages cooperation, actually. Is that basically no, no, a protocol? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. My, my question is directed that way. How would Bitcoin improve uh, the capacity for cooperation? This is what's also, amazing. This is what's amazing about it. So. My argument here would be that the prevalence of politics is related to the ROI on violence, right? The more violable or or stealable property is, the more incentive there is to get to gain control of the political mechanism or to get as close to uh, the political apparatus of power as possible or the printing press, right? You, You have more incentives to become more politicized and rent seeking in an economy where the property can be stolen. But when a, in an economy where the property cannot be stolen, which would be more of a Bitcoin-based economy, your incentives now become productive cooperation. I want to have a long-term trading relationship to create wealth with this, these other counterparties because I, mm-hmm. there's no incentive for me to violence. I could go and bomb them and fight them, and then I can't steal the money at the end of the day. So there's no, there's no carrot at the end of violence or a smaller right. carrot, you could say. Right, so right, it, right, right. And this is where we get back to that kind of psychotechnological upgrade. It's like we've got a new form of money that lowers the return on investment to violent and coercive activities. So it so completely you, turns human action another direction. That's very interesting. So you see it, I mean, and you see it like with argumentation. I'm not just saying it's your opinion, you've got argumentation. You see, you see it as a way of making and I mean this seriously, I'm making human interaction more peaceful. Absolutely. Through a direct financial incentive. And it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot to get your head around because violence or coercion, that is the statist mode of human organization. That's been the alpha and omega of human organization since the dawn of time, right? Whoever has the biggest stick, we've gotten away from it slowly, but we're still in it. <laughs> even though we don't realize it. It's like you right. get a tax bill once a year. Did you negotiate that tax bill or the rate? Or did someone just tell you what you're going to pay? Okay. You wouldn't do that with any other industry. You wouldn't go buy a car and they'd just be like, you know, not it's not negotiable. It's like everything in the market is negotiable. It's the rules even are negotiable. They're consensual. And that's how we, we, we land on these, um, you know, useful rule sets, but to the extent that it's involuntary, there has to be the threat of force behind it. Otherwise no one would adhere to it. So this is like moving us away from the threat of force and economics. That's a very interesting position, Robert. And I don't mean that in a dismissive neutral way. I mean, I, that, <laughs> like that's thought provoking. Um, I, I, I've, uh, I've not heard an argument made this way about the possibilities of Bitcoin bringing about a significant transformation 
in human cognition and and distributed cognition, both individual and distributed. Thank you. Um, I, you know, again, this book actually was the beginning of the journey on this one, the sovereign individual book. Yeah, this was written in 97. And it's, it predicted social media, it predicted um, it, what it called anonymous digital cyber cash, which we call Bitcoin today. And it, the general thesis of the book is that the movement into the digital age, what they call the microprocessor, would essentially subvert and destroy the nation state. So a lot of the functions we've depended on government to satisfy historically can now be that satisfied. Prediction, that prediction has largely been confirmed. And they also predicted um, a global pandemic emerging once the state realized it was losing its power. That once they saw the existential threat to control, that the first thing they would do was a pandemic to reinforce the validity of their borders. So, and this book again was written in 97. So, um, and it's it, the, honestly, the book is great, but then if you go into the bibliography, there's been a, there's tens of thousands of pages have been written on the economics of violence historically. You don't learn about it in school at all, but there's a long history and tradition here of studying this. And, um, you know, this is one of those principles that really Western civilization is founded upon is property rights. Like it's Ayn Rand says, this is the, the quintessential human right without property rights, without ownership over your own time. How can you have any other form of civilization? So, so we've had this marginalized form of property right up until this point, I guess, is the, the big proposition. Hmm. So it's clear that chimps pursue status. Mm -hmm. And there's violence associated with that. Mm -hmm. My concern is if we remove, uh, uh, maybe this isn't the right word economically, but if we remove wealth as the way by which we mark status and thereby that, is, and then wealth incentivizes violence, the argument you've made, my concern is human beings will just find another way of competing for status because status is intrinsically valuable to them. Yes. Um, I, I would qualify that real quick. So this is, we're not removing wealth. Um, so uh, maybe I thought I might have been using the wrong. Yeah. Word. So, yeah. so uh, wealth. I mean, wealth is we we trade and create capital. We become richer. We can yeah. you know yeah. solve more problems more easily. Um, but, but but what I'm what I'm suggesting is are, are I mean the people are also bad faith actors in distributed cognition because they rigged the game in order to win the status competition. Yes. So that's a great, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. The, if we consider again, money, the base layer protocol, right? It's the, yeah. what money is to socioeconomics, thermodynamics is to physical reality, something like that, right? Like it's the rules. Yeah. But so therefore the incentive to control the rules has, that's the whole game. There's no, uh, what does Rothschild say about this? He who has the gold makes the rules. Historically, right. that's been the norm. Yeah. Right. But now Bitcoin is the new game. It's like an incorruptible rule set. It's some it's a man-made invention that no man or government or institution can control. It's just mm -hmm. been it's like just a protocol that's been placed out there and it's ossified. And so it's an invariant. Maybe we could look right. at it that way. Yeah. The yes, invariants yes. force organisms to adapt their strategies to them, right? Organisms have to adapt their strategy to gravity. It's not like we're trying to figure out how to turn gravity off or anything. It's just no option. So right, Bitcoin right. is sort of like that in the economic sphere. It's just this new invariant rule set that incentivizes everyone to play because it's in your self-interest to play, to hold the money that no one can steal, no one can inflate. Um that it simultaneously kind of saves us from ourselves in a way, at least in the, right. through the lens of violence. Like we've been, you know, corrupting the money and then going to war, which will, by the way, the central bank, that's really what it was set up to do. Yes. Government yes, doesn't have enough money, print more money, which is stealing from the productive economy so we can go to war. So now if you eliminate this mechanism of war financing 
And you add in the fact that money can't be really stolen if you if you custody it properly. It just disincentivizes violence in a radical, radically new way. Mm. And so I wonder, you know, the printing press changed us how much? So you're saying, I mean, in addition to the normative argument that you've just made, which I'm hearing uh, and I'm appreciating, uh, you are saying that you now with me, you're trying to also make a cognitive argument, which is a descriptive explanatory prediction, namely that if we were to adopt Bitcoin, that's the normative argument is we should, but if we were, you think we should expect or predict significant changes um, in well, consciousness and cognition, salience landscape, um, consumerism would go down, competitive violence would go down. These are kinds of predictions you're making. Is that correct? Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. And I'm not, I don't take like you, I should be better about quoting my sources as you are, because <laughs> a lot of this is me just, you know, pulling yeah. it from distributive cognition and channeling here. But here's one I got, here's another, this would be a moral aspect to it. Yeah. I got this from Gary North, who wrote a book called Honest Money. Uh, it's an excellent book on the Christian principles of economics, um, but really just describing economics and then layering a Judeo-Christian lens over it. But take this simple example. This is the, the parable of the winemaker, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a winemaker in a centrally banked economy, and he knows that the central bank just doubled the money supply from say $1 trillion to $2 trillion. He's been selling his bottle of wine for $20 a bottle, right, historically. But he knows he's gonna get hit by inflation, right? You double the money supply. Let's just say for simplicity's sake that for him to keep the profit margin on his wine, he would need to double the price. He need to go from $20 a bottle to $40 a bottle. So in an inflationary economy, he basically has three choices. He can one, double the price of his wine. This would cause his customers to look elsewhere. Clearly, you double the price, customers are supply and demand, they're going to look elsewhere. His second option is to keep his bottle uh, priced at $20, right? And he would just eat the loss. So that inflation would just come out of his profit margin. If he had a 30% profit margin on it, I guess it would get cut in half or maybe I'm not doing the math right, but he could eat the loss or he could pass that on to his customers or he can do some, some combination of the two. But his third option would be he could water down the wine or use cheaper ingredients or inferior ingredients. So he could keep selling the same bottle of wine at the same price, but he would have lowered his cost. So he kept his profit margin the same. But what this is tantamount to doing is effectively defrauding his customers. Right? Right? He's selling his... Yeah, he's yeah. selling his customers the same bottle of wine they expect, but it's actually this inferior product. So when a winemaker faces this decision, he is forced to weigh effectively his moral integrity versus his financial integrity. Because even if he's honest, if he's purely honest, he doubles the price of his wine. So his customers are getting the same bottle of wine, same ingredients, he has the same profit margin. Uh, to the extent that he is not purely honest, he's facing, if he doubles the price of his wine, he's facing competition from any other winemaker that would be willing to compromise, you know, even right. at the margins, a couple of drops so of water. It incentivizes people to deception. It incentivizes you into deception in the short run through the manipulating of money. But, but that's also just a function of the temporal discounting overall. Yes, it is, which is influenced yeah. by the yeah. the rate yes. of currency depreciation. Right, right. So there's this there's this corruption, you know, like it's the original sin, like propagating <laughs> forward. It's like you yeah. you lied about the money supply. It used to be one for one gold. Then it's like, oh, it's two for one gold. And then it's like, oh, it's you can't redeem it for gold at all. We're just going to print it ad infinitum. And this deception propagates out into socioeconomic reality. And it mm. screws up all of us. Um, so that's just another angle. And I'm, I'm trying to identify the connection, you know, and I think your work, again, this point of psychotechnology and how there's this conformity between creation and creator gave me a vernacular or 
angle aware. through which to consider it. Yeah. This is, uh, I, I, uh, I've never thought deeply about money as a technology or a sacred technology and its relationship to distributed cognition. So I'm very much appreciating uh, this conversation and uh, the places we're getting into. It's, it's very thought provoking. It's making me, um, it's making me think a, a lot about the connections between a distributed cognition, um, economics, and then ultimately our biological embeddedness in the environment and things like that. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. No, oh, thank you. Um, it, it's very much helped me sharpen the language. Whereas before to say like, oh, the, and this is written about the moral standard and the monetary standard are inexorably linked. A lot of Austrians have written about this. But I don't mm -hmm. know that anyone ever identified the actual mechanism that connected them. It was just an observation. It's like, oh, well, look what happened in this culture. They printed a bunch of money, they became degenerate gamblers, and then it collapsed. But there was not an, a specific mechanism identified. And that's what I'm trying to do. No, and I think, I think what we're working out together, if, uh, if you'll allow me to take some of role course. in this, which is we're working out that the mediating factor is distributed cognitions the distributed cognition and the system the system of psychotechnologies that constitute and regulate that distributed cognition yes of which i think you know they, they call money the language of value yes right? it's, and it's just like if you corrupt if you this is like almost in in uh you know government propaganda or communism has done this a lot where they bastardize the language Yes. If it loses its meaning, all of a sudden it becomes. We, we, uh, we've just done it in general too. I mean, I, like we, I, I, I very often go in the series about how there's like, there's, there's these, there's a, there's a continual force of trivialization and degradation of the meaning of terms. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it, like you take the term ecstasis, which originally mean to stand beyond yourself and transcendence. Mm -hmm. And then it got re reduced to just in a sort of extreme emotional experience. And then it got reduced to the name of a drug that can reliably bring about that sort of extreme mm. altered state of consciousness. And we've lost, we've lost like uh, the significance. So, so language has always got that, th there's, a, a, there's a trivialization process because people are trying to do the compression. Yes. Right? right. But language is also counterbalanced by this generation, there's novelty. Where they're, we're constantly generating new terms, yes, um, um, and creating new terms, um, and it's interesting for my own work. Um, and you've expressed it. And I appreciate that. A lot of people like the language that I'm generating, but mm -hmm. I also get people who really dislike uh, 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 all, all, all the terms and all the language, precisely because it, you know, it's an extra burden on it. it, it it's 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 complicating. Yes. Right. It's easy. why can't you just use simple language? Well, and, and I'm not saying people aren't right to criticize me because I like every professor, I will tend to stray. Yeah. But on the other yeah. hand, you have to be careful because if you're always using simplified language, you're always simplifying your thought. And sometimes you need to complexify your thought. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, and so and, and it's like words are basically the coinage of thought. And, and, and then that's yeah, an old exactly. metaphor going back to yeah, yes. going back to ancient Greece um, in Diogenes saying he would deface the currency and he meant, he meant the currency of thought. Right. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you trying, sorry, that means like you're failing. I appreciate the effort you're putting into trying to get at plausible proposals for the mechanisms mm -hmm. that are relating um distributed cognition to money. I think, yes. I think that's, that's very good work. Thank you. I I'm just endlessly fascinated by it. And um, so maybe let me throw something else. I, out I, here. I, also, I just want to, sorry, I just want to praise you a little bit more. I mean, uh, <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> well, it's, how can I say this? I don't want to be offensive. Um, I'm not easily offended if it's coming at me. I, I, I'm not worried about offending you because you're a good faith actor and I've, I've got that. 
I, I generally don't like people who like Ayn Rand, for example. Uh, I actually don't I, know much about Ayn Rand. I've just heard it. Yeah, and, and yeah. I'm not. And I'm, not, I'm yeah. not trying to do anything. I, what I mean is, but you know, the virtue of selfishness and things like that. Mm -hmm. And and, but I see in you a commitment to real moral purpose. Like there's moral mm -hmm. argument behind it. You you pre, you present arguments with historical plausibility that could lead to the reduction of violence and the reduction of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of incentive to certain kinds of irrational and immoral behavior. And I think that is praiseworthy. I think Thank that's you. praiseworthy. Thank you. I stand on the shoulders of Austrian economic giants. Like I, I credit Mises mostly. Uh, I mentioned yeah. the book, The Sovereign Individual, which is not Austrian economics per se, but there's a long history of thought about this, about how government is at the core of many problems in the world. The fact this coercive element to society, which has historically been necessary, by the way, we needed this monopoly on violence to have property rights, but the technological realities of today potentially are allowing us to evolve past it. This is, um, what's a good analogy here? Maybe um, like, you know, slavery used to be much more common. Yeah. Right. Before we figured out, uh, really technology changed a lot of that. And then technology yes. changes morality in a way. I mean, it, 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 it's interesting because you have two things coming together um, for slavery. Um, and this argument was not original to me, uh, but slavery can only, slavery could only act, was only actually abolished and probably could only be actually abolished. And I'm not saying that slavery is justified. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about, the ability to actually abolish it, yes, because uh, you could get enough of people to uh, agree with to do that. Yes, I, you need the industrial revolution. You basically yes, have to, exactly. right? You have to make, right? Although paradoxically, it's a bit of the industrial revolution that causes the explosion of slavery in the South, the United States. It's the invention of the cotton gin, right? Right. The slavery yes. was fading, but yes. but but it's but then the further industrialization of the North was meaning slavery was. So that's I right. agree with that's that, right. yeah. but you also have you also have this movement that starts way back early in Christianity, and Tom Holland made that argument, right? Where you know Christianity challenges infanticide, it challenges, yes. right? It, it it starts to build all of this, right? Yes. And it slowly built, and then you get Wilberforce and the whole ethical argument, and the two happen to coincide, and then of course you get so, something similar in the United States. So I do <laughs> think it's reasonable to point out the deep connections between moral innovation and economic change. I think yes. that's reasonable. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not either Smith or Marx on this. I, I don't think it's, it, I don't think it's economic completely determines the, the moral sphere. I don't, I, I, I find that implausible for a lot of reasons, but yeah. the, 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 the linking of the two, the way you're doing, I find very plausible. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not a, a, total explanation but i think it's a large contributor um and i think that's viable i think you're making a good point about it and and um and i i, I and, and 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 your second point um that you know your moral purpose is based on the plausibility that you can afford moral change through bringing about certain kinds of economic if that's the right adjective economic mm -hmm. change i think that's also a plausible proposal yeah. Um, thank you. And so sorry, I was just typing something here. There's this other, just to touch on the Christian point again, there, uh, you know, I just brought up Gary North and Honest Money, but there's a lot of Judeo-Christian substrate to a lot of this economic thinking as well, where it's drawing principles from the Bible. There's actually arguments that the Protestant Reformation, which uh, Protestants, it's the Protestant work ethic, right? That spirit is what became instantiated in capitalism, right? This yes. idea of deferring gratification. And then there's a deeper um, assertion there that actually property rights themselves are rooted in the, the ethos of Christ, if you will. We're holding the sovereignty of the individual, right? That you own your time, you own your property more so mm -hmm. than the state. So that, that Christ put the sovereignty of the individual above the sovereignty of the state 
is resonant with the idea the idea of property rights and property rights are the basis of capitalism industrialization the division of labor wealth all of these things so there's something there there's a there's a you know it's like uh what did carl jung say about alchemy it was like the dream from which science was born it's like we need to have this mythology this dream or something to again to work towards i guess to make it a reality maybe we're back maybe we're back to <laughs> causality and value <laughs> um but that's interesting uh i mean because yes i think the protestant work ethic i think weber is right it's a significant driver of capitalism i think mm -hmm. that's very clear uh at least plausible um but you know again i would say that there's things happening and i go over this in the series uh there's things happening that are you know part of Weber's thesis is you know it's it's an anxiety about whether or not you have the proper relationship with god and yes. right, and all of that all of that difficulty right uh and that's also driving it um yes. so that's what i mean about how i see top-down effects from right. religious concerns equally so again i think the emergence and the emanation go both ways right 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 um i'm going to throw one more thing at you here and now what i'd like to try and do is because as i was watching your series originally awakening to the meaning crisis i'm always you know thinking through this lens of money and the corruption of money <laughs> and so now i'm wondering how much could it could the corruption of money be a contributor to the meaning crisis? So one of the things you just brought up was that language is continuously changing, right? There's constantly yeah. new term variation of new terms yeah. Yeah. and then a counter force, people trying to call it back. Like you said, your yeah. critics yeah. make yeah. it more simple. Yeah. So yeah. specificity and generalizability, maybe that's the uh, force and yeah. counter force. Yeah. Back and forth. yeah. Many new terms, and I don't, maybe you can help me with this they seem to reflect like new terms and new language development tend to reflect new technological realities so if, and i don't know if there's a term for this or not but for instance a lot of people today in the di digital age um i always struggle to come up with examples but are like hey let's let me have a quick download with you yes or, or yes. hey uh you know she's got her firewall up that's kind of a less common one but there's all these little software no, no. Yeah. hardware analogies we're talking about interpersonal. personality yeah so yeah. there's metaphor right there's metaphor but it's metaphor working in a different direction almost it's like we created this new tool and now that's we're using part it. of the way which the shaping happens yes yeah so then we're meta yeah. metaphorically adopting that into us so so what i'm getting at here is if if language is this, like it flows like, so the king can charge somebody and then yes. we get the idea of an electric charge. And then we take that back and say, somebody was electric at a party. So you, you can see it coming like all the way around. Yeah. It goes, it goes both ways. Yes. Yeah. So then, okay. We have the, this metaphor feeding back into us from technological realities that are then yep. shaping how we interact. So then I'm wondering like what metaphors are being fed into us from, you know, fiat currency or the corruption of money in a way that's changing how we interact. Um, I, and, and there's, there's a website here. I'd encourage you to check out. It's a very simple website. It's called WTF happen 1971.com. Mm -hmm. And it, so 1971 is when we went off the gold standard internationally. And since then this website lays out a whole gamut of socioeconomic data that shows things that have gone terribly awry since 1971. It's like obesity, suicide, drug addiction, you know, clearly debt, all of these things. And I just wonder, you know, if, if we spend on average, each of us 40 hours a week working, you go to work for money like that it's an indispensable tool to you how much of that is actually influencing your behavior like the characteristics of that particular form of money how much are they feeding back into your your character well, and and one last thing just to put a button on yeah. this is that fiat currency it's a debt-based money so it's a and again it used to be a token for gold then you can't redeem it for gold so it's an irredeemable debt certificate 
And in right. the Christian tradition, uh, the word, the the actual original words for for debt and deception and lies are very closely related. Etymologically, yeah. 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 So, and you know, we talked about the moral thing earlier with with uh, the winemaker. So I'm just wondering, like, is it is it because we have fraud and theft integrated into our money that it's somehow meta- the metaphors are shining back into us and causing us to to just causing us to have a corrupt culture or a meaning crisis. I, um, I hadn't considered that dimension in the argument. I mean, one of the defects of awakening for the meaning crisis is, I mean, I, I tried to consider as many of the causal factors for the meaning crisis as I could, both historical and structural. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's very plausibly likely that I, uh, I missed things, missed important factors. Um, I didn't talk enough, for example, in this series about social media. I didn't talk about um, this aspect of things, this argument. Um, so I, I, I still stand by the arguments I made. I still think the factors I talked about are real and important. But uh, if you're making the point that this could, this could also be a significant contributory factor, I think that's a very reasonable argument that I should take into account. Yeah, I, I have no, no idea, frankly. I'm just really hypothesizing here, but but the way I, I, I hope I'm responding in kind. I'm not yes. accusing you of anything. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, I. Um, again, we it, it's one meaning making tool or faculty. You know, again, yeah. prices and money, all of these things. They're meaning making in a very important way for a lot of your decisions day to day. Yes. So if yeah, all and, of a sudden that's unmoored from reality, I just thought that it, it's it got to be disorienting to some extent. It is. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the arguments you've made are good. Um, yeah, I, I, I think for me, the, the what I feel comfortable, I mean, intellectually comfortably saying is um, that strikes me as a significant plausible factor that should be incorporated into an analysis of the meaning crisis that I didn't take into account when I made the original argument. Um, but I do think, again, that the other factors that I highlighted in the in the series are, are very real, very important. The human proclivity to self-deception, uh, right? All, all kinds of things. Um, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, science unmoored our, our intellectual framework from our existential projects, yes. uh, by, things like that. I think all of, all of those are also very important contributory factors. Well, uh, Agreed completely. I would actually even add that you could look at it that way: is that fiat currency is self-deception at scale. It's yeah, the, it's I, the it, belief we could just print money to fix our problems. Yes, yes. essentially, and it's. And by the way, you talk about self-deception uh, and how it leads to addiction, right? The yeah. reciprocal yes. narrowing, right? Yes, and I, you, I, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you make a very good argument. You made it like that we're basically, we become addicted in a very powerful way. And I think yes. that's right. Yes. I, I think that's argue, I think that argument is right. Yeah. Um, that's another one of those analogies used often historically, but there was never a precise causal mechanism established. Right. But I would say there's probably something there. Like we, you do yes. actually yes. become addicted to fiat. You, have, you need more each time. And yes, it leads yes. to disaster. You, you ultimately the economy, you know, if it doesn't die, it has this mortal event where it has to start over. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, so, and then I'm just <laughs> this chart, <laughs> the zombie chart at the beginning of the book on zombies. One thing that, can, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about this next time, but the spike of the use the prevalence of the use of the word zombie from 1920 to 2008 i think you could put that chart on that website i just mentioned wtf happened 1971.com because the use yeah. of the word zombie spikes after 1971. Um, really uh, yeah i don't it, it just i feel like we're, we've maybe corrupted our collective meaning making apparatus or mythology to some that's extent. the argument i'm hearing you make yes that's the argument i'm hearing you make and i'm taking it very seriously i think there i think there's real value in the argument you're making right now yeah thank you uh so we're at two hours and 40 minutes sorry to bombard you the last 
hour or so with all this. I've just been well, thinking about it so much, but I wanted no, to hear what it's like, was. it's been trapped in this, like a sphere. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. your work just gave me the pipe through it. Oh, that's how maybe this works scientifically, you know? So I've been very excited to, to talk to if you. It, if, you know, well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm glad. I mean, if more, I don't know, again, if I'm using it, but, you know, if economics it was paid more attention to the cognitive science of distributed cognition, like you're trying to do, I think that would be a very valuable thing to do and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I think people who are talking about distributed cognition should pay attention to economic behavior as a clear and perennial case of an important form of distributed cognition. I think it goes both ways. And I hadn't thought about that connection very much until I've been talking to you. I'm happy to put it on your radar. because I think it's very important here. Um, and we, everything we're talking about, like it, the other thing I keep reminding myself of is, is sort of I've gotten deeper into the economics is like how tool oriented we are. Like everything I do yeah, and think. Natural born cyborgs. Yeah, cyborg. Yes, exactly. Andy Clark, we're natural born cyborgs. And, and, and your point is well said that Right, that, that 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 we should look at it not as just physical objects, but also psycho technologies. Yes. What I've made, and also, you know, collective psycho technologies for distributed cognition. Yes, very much. And to your like, point, ethics and yeah. morality, even. Yes. You know, yes. there's like if you're in a pure state of nature, caveman, no one's too worried about ethics and morality. It's the it's the the wealth we create beneath us that give us this buoyancy which is through a market process that allows us the luxury and free time to try and think about ethics and morality. And mm -hmm. um, so there's just something very fundamental there that I think is often taken for granted. You know, we just, we think morality <laughs> is just some arbitrary thing we plucked out of the air and choose to use. It's like, no, it's kind ah. of a tool itself. And um, I'm getting outside of my bounds here, but just trying to, well, that's okay. You're, you're trying, I mean, uh, dialogue was happens when both people are moving to the horizon of intelligibility and they're, they're, they're on, they're in the place where emergent thoughts and proposals are coming to mind that both parties would not have reached on their own. Yes. The purpose of dialogue, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. 